Um, so I just thought I'd start with uh, a few questions uh, about relevance. Um, so I know you had a late night last night, um, but there's a bit of audience participation. So who here thinks that digital services and technology are relevant in the 21st century? The show of hands. Yeah, pretty much everybody. Okay. Um, now, are we as digital and technology people relevant? Today? Yeah. The jury's a little bit out on that one. Um, now, what do our businesses think? Ooh, not sure. I'm going to be a little bit bold. Ooh, jury's definite, definitely out. Um, and how many people think that a high speed rail network in the 21st century is relevant? Ooh, okay, a little bit higher than normal. Not as controversial as I thought. Um, so I'm going to talk about government IT. So thanks, Barry, for actually <laughs> warming me up. Um, a, a bit about um, economics as well. I'm going to talk about maps, and I'm going to talk about visualization of data. So gov.uk. Government technology, well, it's had a pretty bad rap over the last um, few years, certainly in this country. As we saw earlier, uh, it, it's, not, it's a universal issue. Now, the government digital service, which is just down the road, um, they use this term. Um, but there's many differences between the private and public sector. So normally, when you're interacting with a government service, it's at a very emotional time of your life. Certainly it is for me when I'm paying my tax. That's a very special emotional moment. Um, but also, you interact at some other quite um, dramatic moments of your life. It could be interacting with the criminal justice system. And that means we have to make sure that the services that we have are relevant. And frankly, uh, government IT has been pretty rubbish um, over the years. Um, we've got our own version of Medicare. Um, we had the national program for IT, cost hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds. The litigation as a consequence of the failure was not far short of a billion pounds. So we've got our own story to tell here. And that's not just uh, for internal IT. If you were trying to interact with uh, government IT, take prison visits for an example, you'd have to call up. You had a window of just a few hours for booking a prison visit in the whole country. If you missed that slot, you didn't get a visit. All government IT was provided by five companies, over 90%. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, um, it was fractured, our services. We had hundreds of, of websites. It made no sense. You're entering the same information to another government organization over and over again, basically just reflecting the silos of the bureaucracy behind them as opposed to the actual service that was required or that you were trying to get access to. Users, who the hell are they? You know, this is about us. This we're government. We tell people what to do. That's the most important thing. And actually, it cost a ridiculous amount of money. That's about one percent of the UK GDP for rubbish IT. So economics. What has GDP got to do with it all? Well, Liza Minnelli, um, she had a, a pretty good view about money makes the world go round. And it's true, but here are some interesting pieces of information. At the turn of the millennium, the UK, as a percentage of world GDP, was about just below 5%. By 2028, it's going to be 2.6%. And in the same period, the Asian markets, and in fact all the BRICs, are going to be expanding. So if you're not from the UK, um, you should still be a little bit worried because all Western economies are in decline. So by 2028, Europe will be about 14.6%. So David Higgins, he's the chairman of High Speed 2 Limited. And of course he'd say that. But you have to ask yourself why. Now, everyone forgets the United Kingdom is an archipelago. Over 95% of our trade by weight comes by sea. 
14,500 TEU. What's that? That's about a 30-ship Second World War convoy in one ship. The new Maersk e Triple E class are vast. Imagine that hitting our transport infrastructure. Not only that, you only have to travel, not just here in the UK, but around most countries now. Um, the strategic road network is chock-a-block. The first two lanes are usually blocked up with, uh, with trucks and lorries, um, with everyone compressed into the other lane. So it's not just about, um, I'm sure we all experience sniffing someone's um, armpit on a commuter train or struggling with the uh, delayed uh, 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 train um, due to very aging infrastructure. Some of it over 100 years old. And we're going to reach a critical point by the mid-2020s, mid um, the West Coast Main Line, which is the primary uh, route for a lot of freight, is going to be full. And that's not just for passengers. There is no spare capacity for freight. And as we heard earlier, money makes the world go round. And there's a, another challenge. We have a growing population, and it's increasingly urbanized. So that's going to put more demands on the transport infrastructure. Lots of other government services, of course, but on the transport infrastructure. And one of the other challenges, we've got to create a capability for the next generation and generations after that can compete, not just in the UK market, but globally. And the other challenge is we have to rebalance the economy through job creation and moving a London southeast centric economy uh, to other parts of the United Kingdom. We're very lucky that we have a global megacity in the form of London on our shores and we have to maximize that and make sure that distribution and the benefits of having one are distributed. And the other challenge we've got to do is to create that capability by having apprentices, people that do, create a significant amount of graduates. And another thing for the wider community, particularly in urban areas, where, as we saw, the statistics are telling us we're going to have an increasingly urbanized population, we have to regenerate those. There's been successes in London, regeneration around King's Cross, but we need to uh, uh, generate more regeneration across the whole of the country. But all of this comes at a cost, not just financial, but environmental and a human perspective. And we live in a democracy, and it's important that we have an informed debate about something that's so profoundly impactful. One of the other challenges that we have there's an expectation um, that this will be the fastest design and legislative po process this country has ever seen for infrastructure of this type. Um, we've got some massive innovation targets, and one of the challenges we have is that for phase one and phase two, the only way we can actually achieve some of the efficiencies is through innovation, through 5D modeling of our data. So we don't sit in isolation from the rest of the transport infrastructure. It needs to ensure that we fit in a wider strategy. So what has MAPS got all about? Technology and transport and the like. Um, Simon Wardley, um, I had a serendipity moment in about 2012. And probably the most uh, important point here is he's the destroyer of undeserved value. And Barry mentioned about value. And he says that, he said something quite profound to me. He talked about situational awareness. So I'm an ex-military person, and that meant something very, very specific to me. And... What he asked was, why 
is everyone doing it? So 67% of successful companies do cloud, big data, social media. But one of the things you have to ask yourself is why? Why does a general bombard a hill? Is it because a report says 67% of successful generals bombard hills? Or is it they're thinking about situational aware, awareness, the how, the what, the why, the where, the when? And in military terms, where can we attack? Why attack over here as opposed to over there? How do we attack? To do what? When to do it? Now, Simon um, covers, uh, uh, it's quite a complex area. I'm just going to try and quickly gallop through um, just four so around user needs, the value chain, the context, and some tactics where you use lean and agile in an appropriate way. And the context of this, it will be HS2. But first of all, really simple, we all know that. We need to understand what they actually need. But you also need to understand the relationship between all the components that support that need. And then you map it. You map it against where it is from a maturity or evolutionary perspective. And what on earth has that got to do with HS2, technology, and lean? Well, this was the box and wire diagram. I'm sure you've seen hundreds of these in your, your careers um, in 2012. But this is what it looked like once we'd mapped it. And what we noticed, it seemed a bit obvious, I guess, in hindsight, is that the 3D visualization was absolutely critical. And this was after discussing it with the business, not sitting in isolation. We then went through Simon's sort of methodology, approach. We identified the differentiation and the need. We identified everything else was really, that's hidden from a user perspective, and there's lots of things ripe for efficiency. But the challenge we had is our current system was treat as a single um, entity from a commercial and a technology point of view. We broke it down into units. We applied the right methodology. Agile works quite well in sort of the unique and novel end of the spectrum. Lean Six Sigma works at the more ubiquitous industrial end of the spectrum as well. Those things that were of high value, business value, not value to us as an, uh, as a, as an IT department, um, we decided we haven't got a boss in this pit of resources that we'd focus on some high value items. Everything else was a utility, we'd outsource it. We decided where we'd do it, how, platform as a service, data as a service, anything as a service, but we also used uh, uh, open data, open standards, open APIs uh, as an approach. And we prioritized. So, what happened next? I'll talk about each of those. From a government perspective, you heard earlier, we consolidated everything. Gov.uk now is the single platform for all government app, uh, uh, services and departments. There were 25 uh, digital exemplars. Go on the website, have a look. You saw a picture of the website earlier. And the other thing is, we broke down the oligopoly. We've started huge disaggregation of government contracts. Um, over 50% of the sales on the digital marketplace and G Cloud are now with um, uh, SMEs. And overall, um, there's been a significant amount of money put into the SMEs, which is the lifeblood of any economy in a, a country. Gov.uk, as you heard, is now online. And every service, digital service, that we now design in government is based around the user need and it's cheaper. So, HS2, we don't sit in isolation, and in a remarkable mo uh, a piece of cross-political, um, what's the best way, I have to be very careful, um, of alignment, staggering, I've never seen anything like it is that over the last seven, eight years, the ports in this country have been dredged to accept the new container ships. Um, 
we've been investing, there's a, a huge strategic road investment program that's going on. So you might have been impacted if you know uh, the British motorway system. Um, the hard shoulders, which is where sort of people pull over if they've had an accident or, or are in trouble, they're rarely used. What we're going to do is we're going to open those by default um, and use technology to ensure that when there is an incident, you uh, um, are treated appropriately. Um, uh, and as a consequence, there's no major construction requirements, the impacts are low, but you've instantly increased uh, capacity. And of course, the other part where high speed two fits in, I'd love to say that it's about getting to Birmingham 15 minutes faster. If only that were true, it is true. Why would you build a, a, a Victorian railway in the 21st century? Um, but actually you have three types of users on our road, uh, rail network. You have intercity passenger, local passenger, and freight. So crudely, to increase capacity, you get one of those users off onto something else. That something else is the high-speed passenger rail network, which increases capacity on the existing network for freight. And network rail, they're funded in five-year cycles um, from about seven, eight years ago. They've been dropping the tracks under the tunnels and bridges to increase capacity for freight from the ports so that you can use standard ISO carriages to maximize the freight capacity on the network. The other thing is, is we're investing in the capability. There's going to be a high-speed rail college, two campuses, one in Birmingham, one in Doncaster. And the user is going to be at the heart of the design vision for high-speed two. Um, but the other thing is, it's not just the high-speed uh, rail network. It's 350 kilometers per hour. It's also high frequency. Um, 18 hours per hour um, every three minutes. And the only way that they can achieve that is through technology and innovation. Um, and like other government agencies, um, we have to uh, fit within the wider uh, technology strategy. So this is where we were, on-premise, very expensive infrastructure using the Wardley mapping. And this is where we are headed. We delivered the first digital piece of legislation in British history in record time. We're saving, with our migration to cl uh, uh, cloud services, over 95% of our costs of having on-premise. Whilst it's the largest, most complex piece of legislation in British history, it's also the most open. You can use non-proprietary um, uh, software, browsers, whatever you want, any operating system, you can do full text retrieval of the entire piece of legislation. We're releasing data sets onto data.gov.uk, predominantly line of root um, geospatial data. We got um, external accreditation around our maturity for visualization of data, 3D, and over 90% of our infrastructure is now based in um, the cloud. Based on user feedback, both from the public and, the, and Parliament, we created an interactive map um, on our website, and we're also ex uh, working on a street view of the line of route to help with the conversation. And virtual reality proof of concept. So we're looking at VR using Oculus Rifts and looking at uh, holographic stuff to it, it, uh, improve collaboration with the supply chain. The future. Tim O'Reilly, I don't know if he's a relation. <laughs> he talked about government as a platform a very long time ago. That's been embraced in the UK. We're going to be creating platforms which people can build uh, from, create an ecosystem around government platforms. Common tech services, user-centric, virtual reality I've already mentioned, and we'll be creating um, hopefully the first digital way, railway ever. So in summary, um, it's all about capacity. It's about improving our capability so that we can compete globally and collaboration so that we can be as efficient as possible. And of course, it's cheaper, faster and better. And that was underpinned by mapping using Simon's technique. And if done right, we can make a massive difference. And it's incumbent upon us, particularly when you're in a mega project like High Speed 2, that you do do it right and you treat people with the respect they deserve, particularly having a high impact to both them 
their businesses, and the environment. Um, I was going to answer some questions because I might not be here for the panel, but I just thought I'd uh, provide a little bit of evidence. This is the third uh, iteration um, of our visualization of the data that we submit to um, the parliament in this country. Um, this latest iteration, uh, it links back to the various, and you can see um, the references in the top left are to, do, to uh, the design drawings that were submitted to parliament, which are, form part of the legislation. But one of the user feedback that we had is, it's great we've published all this data um, on data.gov, but it was, didn't feel as accessible as it should do. Um, and we are visual beings. Through visualization, it makes it far more real. You can start seeing some of the impacts or some of the mitigations, and you can start trying to drill down what is the access road, what does that actually mean? Um, what is uh, engineering earthworks? What does a balancing pond do? And that provides um, a more informed debate around the subject. So I'm not sure about the time. Uh, probably run over a little bit. So I'm happy to take a couple of questions. I am going to hopefully, I've got to go to a meeting, but I'll hopefully come back uh, later tonight if you want to sort of nab me. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to try and get back for that. Um, but I'm happy to take some questions. So that's going to be, uh, oh, sorry. So what's the role of the college for high-speed rail? So that's going to be looking at trying to create some of the um, STEM-type skills uh, that, that we have. We're working with the local universities uh, and industry to make sure that the skills that come out of there, whether it's apprenticeship engineering-type skills, whether it's technology uh, skills, um, uh, will be fit for them to go into the workplace. So it's basically around science, technology, and engineering, uh, the skills that we're focusing around. Any others? Right. Uh, phase one, I think, to Birmingham, it's about 100 odd miles, and then up to Leeds and Manchester. I think in total, it's about 250, 300 miles max. Um, and it's uh, 250 miles an hour, so it's not the highest speed rail in the world, but it will be the highest frequency. And what's fascinating is that um, we have attracted some inward investment as a consequence of some of our thinking, some of the innovation that's going in from Japan. So they've moved some of their, um, it's the first time they've moved uh, any engineering manufacturing outside of Japan ever. They've moved uh, the Hitachi uh, um, rolling stock to the northeast of the UK a few years ago. So that's very exciting. Okay, thank you very much.